due to how sudden and peculiar Albedo's shift to Nora had occurred, no one noticed it at first. She had completely forgotten the etiquette expected of an envoy during an audience with the head of state. Even if she was a foreigner, this was not an acceptable attitude to display towards a king who was actively leading his nation. Surprisingly, this attitude of hers felt more natural to Zanak, perhaps because the difference in power between the kingdom's king and the sorcerer's kingdom's prime minister was warped to begin with. Human and fiend. From that perspective, her attitude felt the most natural. Perhaps that was why. There was an invisible pressure emanating from Albedo that stopped everyone from voicing their displeasure. That was only temporary, as the fiend quickly put back on her sheep's clothing, the sorcerer's kingdom's envoy. Albedo surveyed the courtiers who were standing on opposite sides of the aisle and proclaimed loudly. This is a formal declaration of war from the sorcerer's kingdom. We will deploy our troops a month from this day at noon. However, if you were to march troops towards Irantal, to cross into the sorcerer's kingdom's borders, then we will no longer follow that timeline. Please wait. I have no intention of tarrying any longer. Alright, with that my work here is done. The last thing I was meant to convey from his majesty was. You planned for things to turn out this way all along, didn't you? Said a rage-filled courtier. Albedo squinted her eyes at him. The message conveyed through those eyes was probably menace. You dare interrupt his majesty the sorcerer king's message, human. Can you not wait to die a month from now? The color instantly drained from the courtier who had spoken out, even though Albedo hadn't raised her voice by much and hadn't done anything unusual. Still, the expressions of the courtier, who had been threatened by some feudal lord with soldiers before, changed dramatically due to a stare from a beauty. Hmm. Now then, allow me to convey his majesty the sorcerer king's message. I have no intention of using grand magic as I had last time, let us enjoy the process. That's all. After saying so, Albedo had a confused expression on her for the first time ever. Even if you say that this was a scheme that we had planned out, to be completely honest, what had occurred was completely out of our expectations. We also wanted to find out how things had turned out this way. Albedo appeared to be telling the truth, judging from her expression and voice, one wouldn't believe that she was lying. Of course, the possibility that this was all an act was also incredibly high. If you wish to treat this incident as our nation's scheme, that is fine by me. History is written by the victors. All of your false accusations will soon be erased. Zanak understood the stance the Sorcerer's Kingdom had adopted for this incident. The idea that they could avoid a war was futile. The Sorcerer's Kingdom had not been seeking to expand its territories through conquest, but rather the complete destruction of the kingdom. It was safe to say that war was inevitable. In a month, the Sorcerer's Kingdom's undead will surely be marching into the kingdom's borders. There's no need to escort me, I do not wish to take up any more of your precious, limited time. After Albedo exhibited the attitude that told them that she had said all that she had wanted to, she turned her back on the rest of them and walked out the door. Was it truly advantageous for the kingdom to let her go without laying their hands on her at all? If they killed this woman who held the office of a prime minister, would it plunge the politics of the sorcerer's kingdom into chaos temporarily, and make them unable to start a war? However, one look upon the back of her dignified figure made him hesitate. As Zanak pondered the possibilities, no one dared to stop Albedo from leaving the room. The giant doors were shut just as Albedo's silhouette disappeared over the side of the doorframe. Zanak said to his father. What should we do? If we chase her. Do not do anything of that sort. If we were to do something like kill the envoy of another nation, the blame for this entire situation will fall on our shoulders. Then no other nations would ever come to our aid. His father replied with a feeble voice as he placed his hand onto his forehead, as if he's having a headache. Zanak felt as though his father had just rapidly aged somewhat compared to just a few moments ago. Your Majesty. Your servant wishes to spread the news that you had offered your head as a gift of repentance to every nation. Yea, I will leave that to you, Minister of Foreign Affairs. If you did that, in the worst case scenario. Please, do not speak of the worst case scenario. Will we not be fine as long as we manage to defeat the Sorcerer King's army? Yea, yea. You are correct. The Minister of Foreign Affairs' words restored some color to his father's face, but the smile he had was still one filled with grief. Zanak, Renner. I have something to tell you. Could you come to my room later? Now then, I do apologize to everyone gathered here, but we will have to convene in another hour to discuss what will happen in a month. The courtiers all lowered their heads and bowed. After the chief of the guards escorted his father out of the room, Zanak and Renner left together. Though Clyme and Brain waited outside the room as Renner's guards, Renner told them to wait in her room, so they just watched as Zanak and Renner left. The two walked shoulder to shoulder through the corridors. So, sister. Do you know why father has summoned us? Yes, I believe it's for the same reason as the one Ani Sama has in mind right now. Is that so? Is father about to show us the delicious desserts that Albedo Kaka had brought over? Yes. 
As expected of Ani-sama, I believe that to be the case too. Zanak stared at Renner with his eyes wide open for a second, to which Renner responded with a smile, as if nothing had just happened. This woman's such a pain to deal with. What do you plan to do? Um. Renner placed her index finger below her chin and tilted her head towards the side. Zanak saw what she was doing and intentionally sighed heavily. What do you get out of acting cute in front of your own brother? Go act for Climb instead, he's the one who's gullible. Ani-sama, that was really rude of you. I'll try this with Climb next, though I did not plan to do so. Isn't Ani Sam is the one who should be asked about what he's planning to do? B. I want to run away. But, that wouldn't be possible. The Sorcerer's Kingdom would surely hunt us down. I was thinking the same thing you know. For a woman who wished to marry a man whose social status was far from hers and had intentionally partnered up with Zanak, that reply was too straight. Zanak had thought that Renner would be the type to value her survival more, and would have planned to leave the palace by tomorrow or something. Perhaps she too understood how impossible it was for them to escape from the grasps of the sorcerer's kingdom, and thus snuffed her desires to do so. Zanak stole a glance at Renner, but could not tell her feelings on that matter through her expressions alone. After the both of them had entered the room, the first words from their father's mouth was just as he had expected. Zanak, Renner. Leave this place at once. You're only just the prince and princess of this country, there is no need for the two of you to die alongside it. The two of them looked at each other and answered in unison that. They did not intend to do so. The expression on their father's face was bittersweet. Is that so, but, there is still time. If you two change your minds, tell me immediately. Though he did not believe that his intentions would change, a man's mind was most prone to falter. Zanak gently nodded his head towards his father. Renner, who was beside him, did the same. The children, upon seeing that brain had returned, ran towards him. Asan, you're back. Asan, Asan. The ten children surrounded Brain, nine boys and a girl. They were all orphans. Brain had taken those who he had believed to have some sort of potential, allowed them to live with him, and was training them in the art of swordsmanship. Because they grew up in a rough environment, they fully understood the importance of violent force, and were able to keep up with his harsh training regimen. Having said that, they were still just children, so Brain was still unsure if they could meet his expectations. Surely if they continued to train like this, they would be able to, at the very least, reach Climb's level. The children stunk of sweat, but it wasn't offensive to Brain. After all, he would be the same after training, this was proof that the children had been working hard. Oi oi, you guys. Are you done with practice? Brick. I practiced so much. My hand. Because they all responded at once, it was hard to fully understand what they were trying to say, but they had completed their practice, that much he did understand. Now then, go take a break. Remember, I told you guys that breaks are part of training too, right? The children agreed in a cacophony of noises. I'll practice with you guys after a while, do not tell me that you're too tired to practice by then, do you understand? The children, once again, agreed in a cacophony of noises. Good. Remember to also fill up on water. Also, don't forget to fill up on salt just because you have been sweating so much. A few of the children said we get it already or us and so naggy, but the majority of them replied that they understood. Good, now go. Oh, right. Before you go, where are those two? The oldest of the bunch, their representative, told him, in the backyard. Brain responded with a no, bid goodbye to the children, and walked towards the backyard. The children returned to the house to dine on the food and drinks they had received from the elderly couple who had been expecting them, and to probably take a nap afterwards. Good exercise, good diet, and good sleep. That was how excellent muscles were built. Brain nodded his head in satisfaction. You made me wait for so long. A woman's voice called out as Brain entered the backyard. Ah, I'm sorry. I had to prepare in advance to accompany Her Highness the Princess on her meetings with the nobility, merchants, and so on, so I was a bit late. There was a man and a woman there, who had been instructing the children before he arrived. The woman who was speaking to Brain, curled up her hair into the shape of a bun, apparently a hairstyle that was called Maggie in the South. Her appearance, rather than being what one would usually consider beautiful, gave off the impression that she was icy and acute. She wasn't too tall, perhaps a bit shorter than most women her age. The other person there, the man, remained silent. Though he had an indifferent attitude which could make one think that he was unhappy, that was not the case. He raised a hand as his form of greeting to Brain. He was just not apt at expressing himself. Brain had actually heard him talk quite a few times in the past, but his voice was as quiet as an ant's. The man wasn't too tall either. He had short legs but was otherwise physically fit, but if a rumor was to spread that he had dwarven heritage, he wouldn't have much in the way of a proof against it. The two were both counted in the six great disciples of the dojo of the swordsman known as Vesher Croft I Lofen.